In this news roundup of the week, continuing good news on Omicron fails to stem the tide of policy chaos and disarray. Germany shuts down three of its nuclear power plants, making it more dependent on fossil fuels. And America counts the cost of defunding the police in 2021. My name's Malin Baker. This is the Malin Baker Show. And a happy new year to you all. To the annoyance of some, for whatever reason, relatively good news has continued this week. Over recent weeks, we've seen that Omicron is significantly milder than previous variants, while of course being massively more transmissible. Today is the day that Sajid Javid said would see COVID infections at a million new cases per day. I went out on a limb and said that was nonsense. Happily, I was right. Actual numbers yesterday were less than a fifth of that number and barely growing rather than the suggested doubling every two or three days. The Times of London reported NHS chiefs saying that there is no need for more Covid curbs. For instance, Chris Hopson, the head of NHS providers, said this, Although the numbers are going up and going up increasingly rapidly, the absence of large numbers of seriously ill older people is providing significant reassurance. This week, it was confirmed that having had an Omicron infection is likely to give you protection against the more severe earlier variants such as Delta, which means that Omicron spread will have the benefit of displacing Delta, so that it's instead of rather than as well as. Researchers from the Africa Health Research Institute found that the blood plasma of people infected with Omicron was able to control Delta in laboratory conditions. Two weeks after an Omicron infection, neutralising antibodies against Delta increased by more than fourfold. The scientists involved said this meant that it could have a significant beneficial impact on the course of the pandemic. That would be good. Of course, we await further evidence of how it's playing out in the real world before jumping to conclusions. But it would be good. Unfortunately, it's unlikely to have much impact on the epidemic of stupid, which is still sweeping the nation and the world. Still, it does seem as though the British government has now accepted the broad implications for the evidence coming both from the studies and from the real-world figures on hospitalisations and deaths. Boris Johnson duly refrained from introducing new restrictions in England in the run-up to the New Year celebrations. But then they went straight in to repeat recent mistakes by urging the whole population to engage in behaviours which they couldn't logistically support when they did exactly exactly what they were told to. So everyone was told to celebrate New Year, but do a rapid flow test before you go. Not the sort of thing you would expect anyone to say unless they knew for sure that the supply of rapid flow tests was up to the task. I mean, right? I mean, if I emailed a million people and offered them a free £10, you would expect I would only do that if I knew that I had £10 million in the bank. Well, no, how very old school of me. Covid testing in tatters as Sajid Javid blames huge surge in demand. A huge surge in demand. Whoever could have anticipated such a thing? Especially since the government changed the rules so that if you've been in contact with someone who got Covid, you can isolate for seven days, not for ten, if you get two negative PCR tests. And of course, those are also in crisis because the supply wasn't increased to meet the boosted demand. According to Mark Fenton of the Grammar School Heads Association, the testing problems will disrupt any hope of a normal return to classes for children in the new year. Doctors are also reported as saying that healthy staff are unable to work because they can't fulfil the twice-weekly NHS testing requirements, so adding to the strain there. The government so far refused to prioritise that tests should be available to NHS staff and it's the staffing issues there more than the weight of Covid cases that is giving the service real challenges. None of these problems are necessary and caused by Omicron. They are caused by stupid policy pronouncements promising system capacity that doesn't exist. 
Still, at least England has avoided those new restrictions. Not so the devolved nations, which have ended up looking ridiculous with the usual odd results of political micromanaging and the fact that they're doing that when England is not. A general principle in the early pandemic stood them in good stead with their electorate, which was to look at whatever Boris Johnson was doing and do the opposite. That has become markedly less popular and with good reason. Wales, run by the Labour Premier Mark Drakeford, is seeing the worst of it. So, for example, on Boxing Day, 50 rugby fans, 50, were allowed to be in the stadium for the Caerphilly under and over 30s match. No more than that allowed in the outdoors stadium. So an additional 140 gathered entirely legally in the indoors clubhouse to watch the match on live stream. The random stupidity when mediocre political figures micromanage your life. The Welsh government has similarly outlawed you travelling to work, unless you have a reasonable excuse. Wanting to make money apparently doesn't count. But if that gets you down, don't worry, because you can go to the local pub with your mates, so long as there's no more than six of you in your group to drown your sorrows. From New Year's Day, Park Run, where people gather outdoors to run five kilometres together, as healthy and socially distanced activity as you can get, those were all cancelled because of the same rules that you can't have groups of more than 50 at an outdoor event. That last one was condemned by UK Health Secretary Sajid Javid, saying it was neither justified nor proportionate. Which is true. Although it's not that long ago that the UK government was telling us how large a scotch egg had to be to be counted as a substantial meal. So let's not derive any universal principles based on party affiliation here. For New Year's Eve, nightclubs and pubs on the borders with Wales and Scotland are expecting significant numbers to come over the border to celebrate in ways that their local leadership would not approve. Because people will generally organise themselves to get around restrictions that don't make intuitive sense. Now, sometimes to their detriment, the right thing to do isn't always the intuitive thing to do. But it's hard to argue that English Omicron and Scottish Omicron or Welsh Omicron are such different beasties that different rules need to apply. Now, in the US, the CDC has changed its isolation guidelines. So whereas previously you needed to isolate for 10 days if you tested positive for COVID, now you only need to do five. The CDC said it was motivated by following the science. More sceptical observers noted that if that had been the case, it would have changed when the understanding of the science changed. Instead, it seemed to be motivated by the fact that America, like Britain, is having trouble staffing the hospitals when so many staff are having to be off for so long. More a case, they suggested, of following the economics, which is not necessarily a bad thing, but the misuse of the following the science justification when that's patently not what's going on just helps to undermine the principle. The CDC also admitted this week that its estimates of the prevalence of Omicron amongst cases in the US had been way off. Add this to the fluctuating guidelines such as on mask wearing and you saw the mocking of CDC becoming a Twitter trend. Senator Josh Hawley's press secretary kicked off with the CDC recommends you put pineapple on your pizza. And the Babylon Bee was quick to join in with CDC now recommends wearing a seatbelt even when you're outside of the car. That one sounds rather plausible to me, but then it's been that kind of year. In a minute, we'll get to some of the rest of the week's news, including the remarkable climate own goal by the new German government. But first, no deep dive video again on Monday back to normal next week. But on Wednesday, we will be kicking off 2022 with the first live stream of the new year. Bring your hopes, your new year resolutions and more. We will be covering the recent events in the news, talking about what might be on the horizon for the next 12 months. And of course, I will be answering your questions from the live chat. Join me for that at 7pm UK time, Wednesday the 5th of January. See you there. Today is the day that Germany takes three of its remaining nuclear power stations off the grid as part of the country's drive to end its use of nuclear energy. That leaves just three plants remaining, which are scheduled to be closed by the end of 2022 at the latest. Nuclear accounted for 10% of Germany's energy, 
And while it believes it can make up the shortfall in the long run by expanding renewables to 80%, in the short term, it will inevitably be burning more of the fossil fuels that it's committed to getting rid of. And it highlights the dispute within the EU right now, and particularly with France, which is championing nuclear as one of the zero carbon technologies to achieve net zero. Instead, Germany is marking the new year by following what might be described as a counterintuitive policy. Let's hope they don't live to regret it, at least not as quickly as have some others, because as 2021 comes to a close, a number of cities in the US are counting the cost of the recent policies for defunding the police. A number of Democrat-led authorities responding to protests in the wake of the George Floyd killing by defunding police departments, as demanded by protesters and politicians like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, who said this, Defund means that black and brown communities are asking for the same budget priorities that white communities have already created for themselves. Schooling to police, etc. Those cities that responded are generally now finishing 2021 with record amounts of serious and violent crimes, leading many of them to backpedal on the policy as rapidly as they can. New York's former mayor Bill de Blasio slashed the police budget and New York has seen rising crime, for instance with murders at 464 in 2021, up by 44% over 2019. That didn't stop de Blasio from boasting that New York is the safest of the top 20 big cities in the country. His successor, Eric Adams, a former police captain, was elected on the promise to restore law and order and he does not believe in defunding the police. Left-wing mayor Laurie Lightfoot foot in Chicago cut the police budget and saw the city's police force lose around 400 officers. Murders there rose by around 4.5% and rape and sexual assault up by 29%. She blamed the victims of smash and grab raids for their own problems, saying that too few of them had hired private security. She's ended up asking for help from federal agents. The Democrat mayor for San Francisco, London Breed, said that she would cut $120 million from police budgets over two years. Crime surged and San Francisco is today more dangerous than 98% of US cities with a 98% again increase in smash and grabs on the previous year. San Francisco residents have a 1 in 16 chance of becoming a victim of violent or property crime. Unsurprisingly, Breed announced a couple of weeks ago that she would be refunding the police, increasing the budget nearly back to its all-time high. In those three cities, killings are at levels not seen for decades. According to the Times of London, records have been set for homicide rates in Austin, Indianapolis, Philadelphia, Columbus, Portland and a number of others. The budget cuts were often made by freezing recruitment, cutting overtime and reducing trainees. And you can add to that the wave of incidents where police who found themselves in difficult situations would previously have had the support of their departments and the support of the state and they were instead hung out to dry. Like Kimberly Potter, the former police officer now awaiting sentence facing up to 15 years in jail for killing Daunt Wright in an incident that nobody claims was anything but a terrible accident. That didn't matter. The state prosecuted her for first and second degree manslaughter anyway and the jury convicted. John Locke, who was a police instructor in defensive tactics for 25 years, told the Minneapolis Star Tribune that he was in a state of shock. It was obviously a hard-to-believe accident. There is no intent to hurt somebody or kill somebody. She made a mistake. Weirdly, when people who do dangerous work get routinely abused for it, unsupported, and are at risk of being prosecuted if something goes wrong, well... A bunch of them just don't stick around. As the former Los Angeles police chief William Bratton said, they got what they wanted. They defunded the police. And what do they get? Rising crime. Cops leaving in droves. Difficulty in recruiting. Voters have not been so keen. The message was blamed by some Democrats for their weak performance at state level in the 2020 elections. In Minneapolis last month, voters rejected a ballot measure that would have replaced the police department with a Department of Public Safety. 
Despite AOCs purporting to speak for black and brown communities, turns out that by and large black communities do not support defunding the police. So a recent poll from Pew Research found that more Americans, including black adults, wanted to increase police funding, not reduce it. And this held true even for groups that had previously supported the call, now that they've seen some of the impacts. An Ipsos poll for USA Today found the same. Only 28% of black Americans, 34% even of Democrats, were in favour of the defund the police movement. This is reflective of the fact that when violent crime spirals upwards, it's often the neighbourhoods with the largest percentages of black people who suffer the most. The middle class suburbs are still mostly peaceful. The question will be whether Democrats can remove the association from them before the midterm elections next year, which, as things currently stand, would go heavily against them. They would need to do the same with the idea of teaching critical race theory in schools, which currently has much of the same dynamic. The answer is almost certainly not, unless the president and vice president can engineer a massive turnaround in their own popularity in the meantime and can do so by drawing a firm line between themselves and the progressives who are most associated with those movements. Is such a thing on Joe Biden's New Year resolution list? We can but speculate. Now in a minute we will run through a few other news headlines from the week and get to the thought for the week. But before that, if you've come this far, then surely it's time to hit that like button. And if you've not subscribed yet, then do that and also hit the notification bell. YouTube tells me that half of the people who have hit the notification bell for my channel nevertheless don't have YouTube notifications enabled. So it doesn't work. If that's you, you might want to fix that so you can get notification when new videos appear here. And if you've done all of those things, why not help to spread the word by sharing this video on whichever social media you use the most? Thank you all. Xi Jinping has been channeling Chairman Mao reportedly in that senior members of the Chinese Communist Party were required to endure a two-day meeting of criticism and self-criticism. The self-criticism sessions, reminiscent of the worst excesses of the Cultural Revolution, saw all the assembled leaders owning up to their various failings and being criticised by others, with one notable exception. As Steve Tsang of the SOAS China Institute noted, she did not make self-criticism. That's the important point. In other words, everybody would have done something wrong, with the exception of Xi Jinping, who can do no wrong. Naming and shaming is not just reserved for the top brass, however. The city of Jingxi saw a shaming parade of people who had broken Covid restrictions, according to the state-run newspaper Guangxi News. The accused were wearing hazmat suits, but with pictures of them hung around their necks as they were led in front of a crowd, while a person with a loudspeaker pressed the point home about how you should follow the rules. You know, just in case the setup was too subtle. Naming and shaming doesn't only happen in China, of course. There's been plenty to go round with the latest round of stories about the UK gender pay gap. To the horror of some, the gender pay gap in the UK has widened, not narrowed, in spite, as this story says, the fact that it is now being reported. I'm reminded of the catchphrase of a friend of mine who often says that you don't fatten a pig by weighing it. But this is now one of those issues where how politicians talk about it and newspapers report on it makes zero sense. Remember, the gender pay gap has nothing to do with men and women being paid different amounts for the same work, the same job. That is illegal and has been for some time. So why are companies being shamed for it? It is the crudest of all measures of average pay for all women in an organisation versus average pay for all men in an organisation, regardless of what they do, regardless of the hours that they work. Now, OK, if you had an organisation that never promoted any women and all the top bosses are only men, then you might see a particularly sharp pay gap. But generally, for the purpose to which it's put, it is a stupid measure derived from stupid town on an exceptionally stupid day. 
People who promote the role of women in the workplace often say that companies should offer flexible working, something highly valued by many working mothers, for instance. Such flexible working makes their lives better, but it makes your gender pay gap worse. People who promote the role of women in the workplace would say companies should actively recruit female new graduates and take on female apprentices and all the rest of it. Get them onto the career ladder. But taking on low paid females, yes, widens your gender pay gap. So it creates perverse incentives not to offer flexible working, not to recruit young women. And yet how we talk about it completely confuses these things. To quote the article, the figures prompted warnings that women face bleak and worsening economic prospects. Really? And yet in the same article it says that there are 1.9 million more women in work, which according to the government's Equality Hub is the result of legislation to the right to flexible working, shared parental leave and pay, and doubling free childcare for eligible working parents. So the right to flexible working, which makes the pay gap worse, is a major factor in getting more women into work. But somehow, that equals bleak and worsening economic prospects. By the way, I don't have data one way or the other relating to people's economic prospects in the strange times we've just been through. There are many people of all sorts facing real problems. It's just that the gender pay gap is not the measure of that. But still, we keep measuring it and writing stories that conflate it with equal pay for equal work. Here we are bearing down once again on a new year. Now, by and large, New Year's are a great opportunity to celebrate and to mark the passing of time. They are relatively lousy at signifying new beginnings for all that people wish that they would. Personally, I'm a great believer in new beginnings, but I've only had two moments in my life that I can recall where I made a real fresh start. The first was when I left university. I knew then that the people I'd known there I wouldn't know for many years in the future and the people I was going on to meet those I would know for a lot longer. So I decided to draw a line. Before I met those new people I tried to visualise the person I wanted to be, gave him a name and actively tried to be that person. And it partly worked. There was a real difference. Identity is a powerful thing. Only partly, for sure, because all of us have aspects that we dislike that are not that easy to simply wipe out, but it was nevertheless a psychological reboot. The second time was some years later when a relationship that I was in was, I guess, early into a downward spiral. You know, when you start keeping score and not in a good way. One day we just paused mid-argument and said, shall we just not do this? You know, why not go back to how we were, giving each other the benefit of a doubt and expecting to enjoy being together? Why don't we just do that? And against all the odds, we just did. Can't say that's ever worked since, but sometimes you can just say, we're into a pattern of behaviour here, What if we interrupted that pattern and did something else? So these things are possible. Maybe I'm just good at new starts. It might be why I have an excellent track record of actually keeping New Year's resolutions for the whole year, not just for half of January. Personally, I think that makes me admirably determined. I can kind of see in the eyes of others that they just think it makes me something of a fanatic. All these things are just tools. If you see yourself as being on a lifelong journey of self-improvement, then new beginnings are an opportunity, amongst others, to ratchet up your habits and behaviours in the direction you want to go. And if you don't want to do all that, well, they can at least be about spending some time to identify what you want next on your bucket list of things to do with your life. The key to it is having a sense of who you are and where it is you're going. People often ask, and certainly used to ask, what is the meaning of life? Viktor Frankl, who survived long years inside Nazi concentration camps and lived to tell the tale, said that this was all wrong. What is the meaning of life isn't the question you ask expecting some outside entity to sort of pop up and hand you the answer. What is the meaning of your life is the question you get asked. And it is down to you 
to provide the answer. Developing your sense of purpose, having a system to constantly keep that purpose in front of you, especially when you're allocating how you're going to spend your time. That is something that coaches will do with some of the highest performing leaders in business, for instance, and performers in elite sports, anyone else that expects to deliver on their promises. You don't have to be either of those things to benefit from knowing what you want to do in life and working out how you're going to get there. If that's not something you've ever done, maybe your New Year's resolution is simply that, you know, to make a start. You don't hit a target that you never aim at. You don't become your better self unless you first define what that is and project yourself into it. All right. My thanks as usual to the good people who support this channel on Patreon. It's only thanks to them that I can stand here at the door to 2022, looking ahead with anticipation for all the content to be produced for this channel. We hope that COVID will fade into the mid-distance, but there will always be other important issues jostling for attention. Government claims and plans to be critically reviewed, emerging trends to be identified and dissected, wild-sounding claims that may or may not turn out to be true. All of that to come, and without fear nor favour to the YouTube algorithm or monetization policies. By the way, I noticed last week that my video with the more provocative than usual title about terrifying mild disease sweeps the nation, that got way more views than usual. There was even a momentary gap where it pushed it to more non-subscribers than usual. Still a lot less than it used to before the algorithm change in March, but nevertheless. I remember how Billy Connolly once described how, as a recovering alcoholic, his body reacted when he was accidentally given porridge that had had whiskey added to it. And his body was just like, immediately, now you're talking. Well, that was how the algorithm responded to that video. Just reminding me, forget all this alt-centre, follow-the-evidence stuff, play to one side, be ideological, make it outrageous, then we'll give you the audience. YouTube is like the drug dealer waiting at the school gates. I asked for an apple, it gave me crack cocaine and promised me more if I liked it. Well, we will not be led by the polarising algorithms, we'll be led by what's important, what's the evidence, what needs to be said that people don't necessarily want to be said. If you would like to help make that happen, to add your support for the independent, fact-focused and non-ideological content that I aim to produce here, please go along to patreon.com forward slash Baker. It is always appreciated. Either way, have a great new year. My name is Malin Baker. This is The Malin Baker Show. Thanks for watching this video. If you liked it, please share with anyone else you think would also enjoy it. Word of mouth is really important to us. And if you've not subscribed yet, what are you waiting for? As the saying goes, that subscribe button won't smash itself. So.